You're listening to The Taylor Marshall Show, episode 108, and it's Ladies' Night here on the podcast. We're looking at two Catholic saints who were mystics and martyrs. Howdy, and thank you for tuning in to The Taylor Marshall Show. This is the podcast for everyone who wants to create daily habits and learn enough theology to take their faith to the next level. And my goal this week is to talk to you about Christianity in the early years. Around the year 200, two saints, females, Perpetua and Felicity. Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening wherever you are in the world. And welcome back to the Taylor Marshall Show we're looking at patristic Christianity. At the New St. Thomas Institute, lately we've been going through the church fathers, and we've been looking at men like St. Ignatius, St. Polycarp, St. Justin Martyr. We've been looking at Tertullian, St. Irenaeus. And one of the most important documents in the early church we haven't spent any time on in the New St. Thomas Institute, primarily because we're looking at the church fathers. But I wanted to spend time looking at two, you might call them mothers, church mothers, and that is St. Perpetua and St. Felicity. I was reading through several times the acts of St. Perpetua and St. Felicity, and it struck me as kind of a weird document. You know, you would expect these young women, Perpetua said to be 22, the age of Felicity is not given You'd expect that in this story of these two women martyrs, you would read about their bishop praying for them and helping them, you know, maybe them studying scripture and learning about Christ and the gospels. But what we see is something quite startling. These young women are accompanied with three men who also become martyrs. So there's five martyrs in total. And there's no mention of bishop, no mention of priests or deacons or any clergy, no mention really of a official institutional church. And they seem to be gaining their knowledge of Christ or their direction, not from pastors, but by celestial visions and dreams. Moreover, the two women in this group of five, Perpetua and Felicity, have, it seems, distanced themselves, or in the case of Felicity, abandoned their husbands. We don't know why. It does say Perpetua is honorably married, and there is a appearance of her husband, though he says nothing. However, we do see Perpetua's father begging her to renounce Christ. And so all these oddities in the text, again, this is taking place around the year 200, 203, maybe as late as 209, have led some scholars to think of this text as perhaps Montanist, which was an ancient heresy. I'll talk a little bit about that. If you're in the New St. Thomas Institute, you've already probably listened or seen the lesson on Montanism. Uh, But we're going to give a little brief introduction to Montanism. They're going to look at some of the text of the Acts of St. Perpetua and Felicity and teach you about these two great saints who are commemorated in the Roman canon, in the Mass in Latin, And we'll also look at one of the most unusual episodes in the Acts of St. Perpetua and Felicity, and that is what seems to be the redemption of Perpetua's little brother from hell, or maybe from purgatory, and how St. Augustine um, tried to wrestle with that unusual theological conundrum. But before we do, let's begin with our Proverb of the Week, and later in the show we'll have our Tip of the Week and our Latin Word of the Week. And some closing thoughts as well. But the proverb of the week, I lifted from Proverbs chapter 31, verse 25. It goes like this. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. I chose this from the famous epilogue of the book of Proverbs about the virtuous woman who is described as the perfect wife, as the ideal mother who supplies her household with all that's needed and lives in wisdom all her days. And ideally, this is wisdom personified in the Old Testament. It is lady wisdom. Uh, We see here in the book of Proverbs calling out to young men, 
Um, we see her quasi incarnate in the Blessed Virgin Mary. Liturgically, the church le- reads these passages about Lady Wisdom and applies them to Our Lady. Why? Because she is the Immaculate Conception. She was conceived without original sin, and she is the seat of wisdom. She's the throne of wisdom. And so by looking to her, we gain a heart of wisdom. And of course, wisdom incarnate in the real sense is her incarnate son, Jesus Christ. But I think this applies to Christian women in general. Not all Christian women, because of sin, live up to it perfectly. But in particular, our two saints today, St. Perpetua and St. Felicity, Strength and dignity are their clothing. Uh, They were thrown to the wild beasts. The account says that there were lions, bears, and leopards in the arena, and that this is how they died, by being eaten, alive, mauled by a wild beast. So they are clothed in strength and dignity, even though they were stripped naked. These two women, um, Felicity had given birth just days before she was martyred, and uh, Perpetua was nursing an infant. So these are... Um, young mothers who are stripped naked in the sight of men at the stadium and then ripped apart by animals. But what's interesting about this verse in Proverbs, verse 25, is it says, she laughs at the time to come. In other words, the virtuous woman, and this could be the virtuous man or the, or the virtuous woman in our own time, looks into the future at the days to come and laughs. Rejoices. I think this could be taken two ways. First of all, it could be that you look into the decades to come or the years to come and you see that God is going to lead you and therefore you rejoice, you laugh. But I think if we take it in an allegorical way, we can look into the days to come, that is, into eternity, into the everlasting beatitude that we will have with Christ face to face in the beatific vision. And we rejoice in that. So whether you're in a situation like St. Perpetua, where you're naked in a stadium with animals tearing at your flesh, or you're just a businessman or a mother listening and you have hardships in your life, whether it's a troubled child or a troubled business or a troubled marriage, or maybe you're listening to this in a persecuted area of the world. I was once told that there was a, a bishop in the Middle East who was persecuted who listened to me on the podcast, and that gave me great encouragement and reminded me that not everyone who listens to this podcast is, you know, living in a middle class, convenient, um, by the world standards, luxurious situation as many of us are in America, but there are people all over the world in different positions. So you could be persecuted or you could just be having a hard go at it in life, but we can look at the times to come and laugh just like Lady Wisdom, just like the saints, and just like the martyrs. All right, so let's take a look at our featured segment, and that is the Acts of St. Perpetua and of St. Felicity. I became interested in this topic for two reasons. One I already mentioned, in the new St. Thomas Institute, we are working on and delivering our certificate in Catholic Church history. And so we have hundreds, even now thousands of students who are working with me through this certificate in Catholic Church history. We started with the Old Testament. And we looked at the lives of the apostles and the Dormition and Assumption of Our Lady and the apostles and the, the uh, apostolic fathers and the early apologists. And we've been working through here, and I've just been, the last six months or so, just immersed in church history, in particular the church fathers and primary texts and secondary texts. And I've been thinking about Montanism and heresies, and then when I came across some of this literature on St. Perpetua and Felicity and some of the influences perhaps in that text, I got a renewed interest in it. But also, in the last several months, my little sister, Amber, gave birth to a beautiful daughter, and she named her Felicity. And so I wanted to look into the story of St. Felicity and get to know her better as a Catholic saint. And so I started reading the Acts of Perpetua and Felicity, and different versions of them. There are different Greek and Latin versions of the Acts of St. Perpetua and Felicity. And I actually thought about reading the entire Acts here on the podcast. It's really only six chapters long. It'll take you probably no more than 10 minutes to read it. So I could theoretically read it on the podcast. I decided not to do that. I would encourage you to go ahead and find it. If you're a member of the New St. Thomas Institute, we have a free copy of it waiting for you. 
just go into your digital library and go into the Fathers of the Church section. We have the whole thing there for you. You can read it in the New St. Thomas Institute or download it. Uh, if you aren't a member of the New St. Thomas Institute, you can um, order a copy of it on Amazon.com, or I'm sure if you Google online, you'll find um, someone's put up a digital copy copy somewhere. There are different versions. Um, I recommend the one that's in the New St. Thomas Institute. So as you're looking around, look for the one that's the complete, that has the six chapters in it. As I mentioned earlier, this document dates to the early 200s. Perpetua and Felicity and the three men who were martyred with them were martyred around the year 202-203. The document is six chapters long, and it contains first-person testimony from Perpetua herself. And so this is, as far as we know, the earliest uh, recorded document from a Christian woman. That's why I said at the beginning, this is Ladies' Night here on the Taylor Marshall Show, because this is the first recorded female perspective on Christianity. Now, of course, we have Our Lady and St. Luke's Gospel, um, but here we have a Christian woman speaking in the first person. And so people think what happened is, is that Perpetua, while she was in prison, waiting for her martyrdom, that she had a diary. We know from the text that Perpetua was a noble woman and that she was wealthy and that she came from an aristocratic family. So she and her family was visiting her. We see that as well while she's in prison. So she likely was educated. She could read and write, and she likely had access to a way to record her thoughts and her visions. Later, what she left behind was assembled by an editor, and no one knows who that editor is. However, there is a tradition that the editor of these acts of perpetual and felicity was none other than Tertullian. Tertullian, you might remember, was the great Western Latin theologian in North Africa. He's the first one to use the word trinity in Latin, trinitas. Whether he invented that or he's just the first to use it, we get the word trinity from Tertullian. He's not a saint. He's not Saint Tertullian because... Around the year 200 or so, he espoused the movement called the New Prophecy, later called Montanism. Montanism is named after a man named Montanus who lived in Phrygia. He had with him two other female prophets, and they spoke, they claimed, on behalf of the Holy Spirit. Montanus would say things like, you know, behold, listen to the Father, to the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and he would utter his prophecies. And it was a huge movement in the early church, not only in Asia Minor and Phrygia, but extending into Western Europe, as far as Gaul, and into North Africa, where Tertullian lived. And the movement was marked by a hostility towards the institution of the church. There were bishops, who were claiming to be the successor of the apostles, as we believe in Catholics. And these Montanists, these adherents to the new prophecies, believed that the Holy Spirit was still speaking to the church through signs, prophecies, wonders, and dreams. Remember, the Bible, although it's been written, has not been fully assembled yet. That started to happen in the second century, where we start seeing bishops and saints arguing about which books are in and which books are out. It's coming together. You see it in Justin Martyr. You see it in Irenaeus. But the canon is not really assembled till around the year 382, right? So this is, you know, into the life of St. Jerome under Pope Damasus. And so you have Christians in the early church who want to know about Christ, and they're receiving visions. And I myself personally believe that probably there were many saints, many pious Christians who were receiving direct revelations from Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. And in fact, if we're to believe the acts of Perpetua and Felicity, as we're studying today, Perpetua herself received visions and instructions from heaven. Two visions in particular we're going to study today. One comes from the opening chapter. Again, there's six chapters in these acts. The opening chapter gives the vision of the ladder and the dragon. And then in chapter 3, we have the vision of Perpetua's little brother in what seems to be hell. 
Now, I mentioned Tertullian. I've mentioned the Montanists. Many scholars have looked at these acts and they've said, you know, it seems like this is a Montanist document and that Perpetual and Felicity are likely Montanists. So why is that? Well, first of all, they're dependent on visions and dreams, not on bishops, not on priests. They don't seem to be consulting with tradition or Bibles. They're consulting instead with their dreams. Also, Felicity has left her husband, and she seems a little bit bitter about it. She's asked by the magistrate about him, and she says that he's a common man, and she's left him, and she seems to have consecrated herself to Christ. This was a pattern in the Montanist sect of couples separating from themselves, of women leaving their husbands, the two female prophets who prophesied with Montanist, we are told from other sources, have left their husbands as well. And then, of course, these women, uh, or sorry, the document itself speaks of new prophecies and new visions. And we know from Tertullian that they called their, their movement not Montanism, but they called it the new prophecy. So maybe this document is influenced by this sect coming from Phrygia. Do we know for sure? No, we don't. And I don't think we can settle it for sure. I think we can also state that Tertullian himself seems to have remained orthodox even while he was under the influence of the new prophecy. He defends the new prophecy. There was a time when one of the popes, Tertullian tells us, approved of the new prophecy, Montanism. Also, St. Irenaeus, who was from Asia Minor, from the areas close to Phrygia, um, he was the bishop in Lyon, which is modern-day France. He actually went and traveled all the way to Rome to ask for leniency against the Montanists. So he seems to have a bit of a sympathy for the Montanists. And my own theory is that the Montanists, these visionaries, these charismatics, these kind of like Pentecostal Christians, probably early on were Orthodox. And it wasn't until later in the 200s that some of the more strange and unusual things happened. And eventually they moved out of the Catholic Church and founded their own churches, their own bishops, etc. We see this written already in Epiphanius and Eusebius in their church history and in their documents. So probably during the time of Tertullian, the movement is Orthodox. Basil the Great, by the way, talks about, well, he thinks they're heretical by his time, but he's in the late 300s. Um, but earlier, they seem to be Trinitarian and Orthodox. So we don't know for sure, okay? But it seems that some of the tendencies in Montanism are expressed in the lives and in the work of Perpetua and Felicity. So let's take a look at a couple of these visions, these prophetic dreams that Perpetua experienced. And the first one's in chapter 1. It begins with a man who she calls her brother, and he says to her, My dear sister, you are already in a position of great dignity and are such that you may ask for a vision, that it may be known to you whether this is a result in a passion or an escape. So he says, look, you're in this position of dignity. You're in prison. And so you should ask for a vision from the Lord to know if you're going to be a martyr or you're going to get out of jail. And so she says, and I, who knew that I was privileged to converse with the Lord. Isn't that interesting? She says, I had the privilege to converse with the Lord. Because she's suffering, she feels that she can converse with Jesus. She goes on to say, whose kindness I had found to be so great, boldly promised him and said, tomorrow I will tell you. And I asked, and this was what was shown to me. I saw a golden ladder of marvelous height reaching up to the heaven very narrow, so that persons could only ascend it one by one. And on the sides of the ladder was fixed every kind of iron weapon. There were swords, lances, hooks, daggers, so that if anyone went up carelessly or not looking upwards, he would be torn to pieces and his flesh would cleave to the iron weapons. And under the ladder was crouching a dragon of wonderful size who lay in wait for those who ascended and frightened them from the ascent. And Satyrus went up first, that's one of the men she's with, who had subsequently delivered himself up freely on our account, not having been present at the time that we were taken prisoners. And he attained to the top of the ladder and turned towards me and said to me, Perpetua, I am waiting for you, but be careful that the dragon does not bite you. And I said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, he shall not hurt me. 
And from under the ladder itself, as in fear of me, he slowly lifted up his head. And as I trod up the first step, I trod upon his head. And I went up and saw an immense extent of garden. And in the midst of the garden, a white-haired man sitting in the dress of a shepherd, of a large stature, milking sheep, and standing around were many thousand white-robed ones. And he raised his head and looked upon me and said to me, You are welcome, daughter. And he called me, and from the cheese, as he was milking, he gave me, as it were, a little cake. And I received it with folding hands, and I ate it. And all who stood around said, Amen. And at the sound of their voices, I was awakened, still tasting a sweetness that I cannot describe. And I immediately related this to my brother, and we understood that it was to be a passion, and we ceased henceforth to have any hope in this world. End quote. So here we see Perpetua. Satyrus goes up the ladder first. The ladder has these weapons on each side, so you have to be careful as you climb. Beneath the ladder is this dragon, and he's waiting for people to fall off the ladder and into his mouth. And she goes up, and when she gets to the top, she finds a garden. And in the garden is a shepherd with white hair. By the way, if you listen to my commentary series on the book of Revelation, we see that in the apocalypse, Christ has white hair. So she's, she's seen the same thing that John saw in the apocalypse. And he's milking sheep, and he gives her some cheese that he gets from the lambs, and she eats it, and it gives her this sweet taste. And then she wakes up when everybody says amen, and she realizes it's going to be a passion. She is going to be martyred. So here we see a woman and her brother in prison. They don't know what to do, and so they ask for a vision, and they receive the vision, an unusual vision, the ladder, the weapons on the ladder, the, ladder, the, the dragon, and from that she knows to prepare herself. And I like her conclusion at the end. She says, and we seized henceforth to have any hope in the world. At that moment she knew there was no more hope in this world, she was going to be a martyr. I want to turn now to the next vision, which is in the next chapter, chapter 2, and it's the vision of Perpetua for her little brother who died at age 7. His name is Denocrates, and it goes like this in chapter 2. After This is Perpetua speaking, quote, After a few days, while we were all praying, so this is the five Christians in prison praying, on a sudden, in the middle of our prayer, there came to me a word and I named Denocrates. Now, I don't know what kind of prayer is going on here. It seems kind of like a charismatic prayer circle. And she says a word came to her, and that word was Denocrates. And I was amazed that the name had never come into my mind until then. And I was grieved as I remembered his misfortune. And I felt myself immediately to be worthy and to be called on to ask on his behalf. And for him, I began earnestly to make supplication and to cry with groaning to the Lord without delay on that very night, this was shown to me in a vision. I saw Denocrates going out from a gloomy place where also there were several others, and he was parched and very thirsty with a filthy countenance and a pallid color. And the wound on his faith, sorry, on, and the wound on his face, which he had when he died, this Denocrates had been my brother after the flesh seven years of age, who died miserably from a disease, his face being so eaten out with cancer that his death caused repugnance to all men. For him I had made my prayer, and between him and me there was a large interval, so that neither of us could approach the other. And moreover, in the same place where Denocrates was, there was a pool full of water, having its brink higher than was the stature of the boy. And Denocrates raised himself up as if to drink. And I was grieved that, although the pool held water still on account of the height to its brink, he could not drink. And I was aroused and knew that my brother was in suffering. But I trusted that my prayer could bring help to his suffering. And I prayed for him every day until we passed over into the prison of the camp. For we were to fight in the camp show. Then was the birthday of Gaeta Caesar, and I made my prayer for my brother day and night, groaning and weeping, that he might be granted to me. Then, on the day on which we remained in fetters, this was shown to me. So here she sees another vision. 
By the way, so she see just to explain what's going on here, she sees her her little brother. He was seven years old. He had died of cancer, cancer of the face, and had eaten away his face. And they said that his death was a repugnance to all men. And he's in this dark place. He's unhappy, and he's trying to reach up to a pool that's above his head, and he can't get to the water. And so Perpetua is praying day and night and mourning and crying for the relief of her brother, Denocrates. So then she says, in her next vision, I saw that place which I had formerly observed to be in gloom was now bright, and Denocrates, with a clean body, well-clad, was finding refreshment. And where there had been a wound on his face, I saw a scar. In the pool which I had before seen, I saw now with its margin lowered even to the boy's navel, so to his belly button. And one drew water from the pool incessantly, and upon its brink was a goblet filled with water. And Denocrates drew near and began to drink from it, and the goblet did not fail. And when he was satisfied, he went away from the water to play joyously after the manner of children, and I awoke. Then I understood that he was translated from the place of punishment, end quote. This is a beautiful account, I think, and it raises the question for us, where is Denocrates? Well, there's a few options. He could be in hell itself. That's kind of hard to believe because he's seven years old. Um, He could be in purgatory, or he could be in the limbo of the children. So which is it? Well, I'm not sure. Um, It's a difficult passage. St. Augustine does comment on it because in his time, people were bringing up the Acts of Perpetual and saying, look, there seems to be this unusual situation. St. Perpetual, she's a saint of the Catholic Church. She's a martyr. She sees her little brother in what seems to be hell because she says at the very end, then I understood that he was translated from the place of punishment. So he's in a place of punishment. Seems to be hell. He's seven years old. He's not baptized. Remember, Perpetua's family is not Christian. They're pagans. So here's a little boy who was seven, just at the age of reason. And he's from a pagan family, so he's not baptized. And he goes to this dark place, and he seems to still have the suffering or the malady of the cancer on his face in some kind of spiritual form. And Perpetua, because she knows she's going to be a martyr, she knows her prayers have power. And so she begins to offer her sacrifice for this little boy, her little brother. And we see that suddenly his body's clean. He's in clean clothes. His wound is healed. There's just a scar there. Not perfectly regenerated, but there is a scar and the wound is gone. And the pool, which had been above the boy's head, is now at the level of his belly button. And he's given a goblet or a chalice, and he fills the goblet with water, and he drinks of it, and he's satisfied. And then he goes away to play, she says, as in the manner of children. So it's it's quite beautiful, and I I like this because it shows that the early martyrs um, weren't just thinking about their own glory, but they were thinking, how can I apply my suffering, my faith, my merits to people who are suffering to others. And so Perpetua reaches out spiritually to Denocrates. Now, Augustine, for obvious reasons, doesn't like this passage. As you know, St. Augustine believes that all unbaptized babies go to hell and they do suffer. He He does later in his writings minimize their suffering. He does not place them in what what we know as a limbo that comes later in Latin theology, but he does place them in Gehenna, and they're not suffering for actual sins, they're not suffering for venial sins or moral sins, because these children have not committed any sins, but they are suffering ever so slightly for original sin. That's the teaching of Augustine. If you'd like to learn more about that, you can get my brief book called St. Augustine in 50 Pages. I talk about that a little bit in that short book on Augustine. Um, So maybe that's where Perpetua is seeing uh, Denocrates, maybe it's a a modified limbo that's not quite as um, naturally beatific as St. Thomas Aquinas would see it, or maybe it's purgatory. You know, maybe uh, this boy had an implicit desire for baptism in some way, uh, but did have some sins 
uh, some venial sins that a young boy might have. And so he needs to be lifted up and delivered out of purgatory. And that's probably the most orthodox and best answer, um, given what we know about theology and the development of Catholic theology over time as it relates to uh, the afterlife. So my guess is that this is purgatory. It would it would fit with what Perpetua says, that he was translated from the place of punishment. Purgatory is a place of punishment, and we know that people can get out of purgatory and go to heaven. Probably what's happening here. I'd like to close our discussion on the Acts of Perpetua and Felicity with the final section, which is the martyrdom of the... Uh, perpetual felicity and the men that are with them who are Christians, um, one of which seems to have catechized them or, or taught them. Uh, before I do, though, I just wanted to mention some of the, the more intimate details in the narrative. Um, I mentioned before that Perpetua is nursing her infant. So her father and her family are bringing her the infant to prison, and she is giving milk to the infant and then handing it back. And the infant's going back and forth. And this is, you can see trying on Perpetua because she's drawn um, in her instincts to be a mother and to pres- to provide milk for the baby. And I think that's the reason why in the opening scene when she gets to the garden, what does the white-haired Jesus, the shepherd, give her? He gives her, he's milking the, sh- the sheep, and he gives her the cheese that he's made from the milk. So there's this, there's this milk imagery that she's giving milk to her baby and Jesus is giving her milk and in a form of dairy product. And also this idea that milk is being given to her. She's newly baptized. She's baptized in prison. So she's a newborn in Christ. And so she's receiving the milk. But she also refers um, throughout the uh, story to um, not only nursing the baby, but since she doesn't have the baby with her all the time, she talks about how her breasts are becoming painful and tender because she's engorged. She can't give the milk to her baby because she's in prison and the baby's back at home. Um, For example, in the second chapter, she says, and even as God willed it, the child no longer desired the breast. So since the baby's been away from her so long, she's starting, the baby's not wanting to nurse as much. Uh, The baby's becoming weaned because of this trial. And she says, nor did my breast cause me uneasiness, lest I should be tormented by care for my babe by the pain of my breasts at once. And then later on, her co-martyr, Felicity, we haven't talked too much about her, but Felicity's in prison with her. And if you read the actual, you'll see some of her dialogue as well. But she's actually pregnant when she's arrested for her Christian faith. And she prays to Jesus, and they all pray for her, that she will have her baby before she's martyred, because she doesn't want her baby to die. So this is a great pro-life message. And they pray, and she goes into labor, and she delivers the baby. And so she also is a new mother. So both of these women, Perpetua is 22, we don't know how old Felicity is, they both have infants. And so in the very final section, we read this. Um, Moreover, for the young women, that is Perpetua and Felicity, the devil prepared a fierce cow, provided especially for that purpose, contrary to custom and custom, reviling their sex also in that of the beasts. And so stripped and clothed with nets, they were led forth. The populace shuddered as they saw one young woman of delicate frame and another with breasts still drooping from her recent childbirth. Um, So if you're a woman who's had a baby or if you're a dad and you're married to a woman who has a baby, you know that after a baby's born, the woman's Breast fill. They droop because they're so full of milk. And so they see this young girl, Felicity. Um, they're naked. They're under these nets. And the people realize that she must be a new mother because her breasts are still drooping from the recent childbirth. So being recalled, they are unbound. Perpetua is led first in. She was tossed and fell on her loins. And when she saw her tunic torn from her side, she drew it over her as a veil for her middle, rather mindful of her modesty than her suffering. Then she was called for again and bound up for her uh, and bound up her disheveled hair, for it was not becoming for a martyr to suffer with disheveled hair, lest she should appear to be mourning in her glory. So she rose up, and when 
She saw Felicity crushed. She approached and gave her hand and lifted her up. And both of them stood together. And the brutality of the populace being appeased, they were recalled to the Sanavivarian gate. Then Perpetua was received by a certain one who was still a catechumen, Rusticus by name, who kept close to her. And she, as if aroused from sleep, so deeply had she been in the spirit and in ecstasy, began to look around her and say to the amazement of all, quote, I cannot tell when we are to be let out to that cow. And when she had heard what had already happened, she did not believe it until she had perceived certain signs of injury in her own body and in her dress, and having recognized the catechumen. Afterwards, causing that catechumen and her brother to approach, she addressed them, saying, Stand fast in the faith and love one another, all of you, and do not be offended at my sufferings. I'm going to pause here and just note that throughout her being trampled in Felicity, she's caring about her hair not being disheveled because she doesn't want to look she's mourning or she's sad. And she's also trying to cover herself for the sake of modesty. So it shows a supernatural serenity as she stands there before people, hundreds of people with the wild beasts in the stadium. It goes on to say the same satirist at the other entrance exhorted the soldier Putin saying, assuredly, here I am, as I have promised and foretold for up to this moment, I have felt no beast and now believe with your whole heart. Behold, I am going forth to that beast and I shall be destroyed with one bite of the leopard. And immediately at the conclusion of the exhibition, he was thrown to the leopard and with one bite of his, he was bathed with such a quantity of blood that the people shouted out to him as he was returning the testimony of his second baptism, saved and washed, saved and washed. Manifestly, he was assuredly saved who had been glorified in such a spectacle. Then to the soldier Pudens he said, Farewell, and be mindful of my faith, and let not these things disturb, but confirm you. And at the same time he asked for a little ring from his finger, and returned it to him, bathed in his wound, leaving to him an inherited token in the memory of his blood. And then lifeless, he is cast down with the rest to be slaughtered in the usual place. And when the populace called for them into the midst, that as the sword penetrated into their body, they might make their eyes partners in the murder, they rose up on their own accord and transferred themselves whither the people wished. But they kissed first one another, that they might consummate their martyrdom with the kiss of peace. The rest indeed, immovable and in silence, received the sword thrust, much more satirist, who had also first ascended the ladder. The first gave up his spirit, for he also was waiting for Perpetua. But Perpetua, that she might taste some pain, being pierced between the ribs, cried out loudly, and she herself placed the wavering right hand of the youthful gladiator at her throat, Possibly such a woman could not have been slain unless she herself had willed it, because she was feared by the impure spirit. And there's a doxology here at the end that I want to share with you. Quote, O most brave and blessed martyrs, O truly called and chosen unto the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom whoever magnifies and honors and adores assuredly ought to read these examples for the edification of the church, not less than the ancient ones, so that new virtues also may testify that one and the same Holy Spirit is always operating even until now, and God the Father omnipotent and his Son Jesus Christ our Lord, who is the glory and infinite power forever and ever. Amen. End quote. So there it is, these great martyrs, St. Perpetua, St. Felicity, pray for us. Well, before we get to the tip of the week, I just have a few announcements. Uh, first of all, this podcast is now available not only on iTunes and through Stitcher and all sorts of Android uh, avenues, but also now on YouTube. We've been making these lessons into still videos. So if you prefer to listen to them or you want to share these podcasts, you can go to youtube.com and search for my YouTube channel. It's called Dr. Taylor Marshall. So just search Dr. Taylor Marshall. You'll find the channel and you'll find all hundred or so podcasts there on YouTube. Also, my book, Speaking of Martyrs, Speaking of Suffering, 
my sequel to Sword and Serpent, which is a, a best-selling historical fiction novel about St. George, St. Christopher, St. Nicholas, and also Constantine, the first Christian emperor, uh, will be coming out in later this year, hopefully this summer, but maybe push back as far as Christmas, but hopefully before then. Um, the title is not yet decided. I'm just calling it Sword and Serpent 2 for now, but we'll have a snazzy title ready to go here soon. So stay tuned. Um, keep up over at taylormarshall.com. That's my site, and we'll be announcing the release date and how you can get your own copy. And if you haven't read the first one, I would encourage you, if you like what we talked about today, you like martyrdom, you like early Christianity, um, you like the inward um, mental and spiritual struggle that these early Christians had, these early saints had, then you'll love my novel. It's called Sword and Serpent. It's a historical retelling of St. George and the dragon. You might think, well, how's the dragon historical? You'll have to see. It's kind of a twist. So you can go to Amazon.com and you can search my name, Taylor Marshall, to see all my books. Or you can just search the title. I'd recommend that, Sword and Serpent, about St. George. Also, if you'd like to study church history, you want to learn more about some of the saints we talked about or other saints from this time period and the theology of this time period, I would encourage you to sign up at the New St. Thomas Institute. Right now, we have open enrollment for summer for students, and we've had several hundred join up in the last couple weeks. So if you'd like to earn your certificate in Catholic theology or certificate in Catholic apologetics or certificate right now, we're also doing a certificate in Catholic church history. Go to NewStThomas.com, NewStThomas.com, and sign up. You can sign up for as little as $1 a day, which is extremely inexpensive tuition when you consider that advanced college classes in theology or history are going to be about $2,000 just for one. That doesn't even count the books. And of course, we provide all the text and the books for you for free in a digital form at NewStThomas.com. So go and check it out. Okay, our tip of the week is one that I've been wanting to try for a couple of years now, and I finally did it. Joy, my wife, challenged me to do it. We're doing it together. We are doing 30 days with no social media. 30 days a fast from social media. For me, that means Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Same thing for Joy. Joy's not on, really on Twitter, but Facebook and Instagram. And let me tell you, I'm now, ooh, I think, 21 days into it. I love it. Joy loves it. It's fantastic. I feel like I did back in like my 20s when there weren't, there was no such thing as Facebook and Twitter and iPhones and all the dings and the buzzes and the interruptions and all that. Time has slowed down for me, and I have much more time throughout the day. Instead of in the evenings looking at my phone to see a latest update or posting a picture of my family or my kids or something, instead, I'm reading a book to one of my kids. Instead, I'm sitting on the couch and listening about someone's day. I'm just more present. I'm just more in the moment. You know, we have eight kids. There's a lot to hear and a lot to go on. And I think the distractions of hundreds of other people, or actually for me, thousands of people on Facebook might just be too much. So my tip, my suggestion, my challenge for you would be to take occasionally, maybe don't give it up forever, take a fast from social media. Maybe do it for one week and see how you feel. I'm doing it for 30 days. Maybe I'll give you a report after 30 days. But it's been good for me spiritually. It's given me more time with the family. It's given me a quietness in my soul. And I've also found that I've been reading a lot more. I've been reading a lot more. I read a lot of books as is, but I've been reading a lot more books because I'm not distracted by looking at articles or what my friends or what people are saying on Facebook. And by the way, if you've been trying to reach out to me on Facebook for the past 21 days, I apologize that I haven't responded. I've just been on the Facebook fast, and I love it. All right, before we get to Latin Word of the Week, I just want to encourage you, if you're new to this podcast, please go to my website, taylormarshall.com. There's a free gift for you. It's a free 
ebook called Thomas Aquinas in 50 Pages. If you've ever wanted to study Catholic philosophy or Catholic theology, you just don't know where to begin. Begin with Thomas Aquinas. Go to taylormarshall.com. It's a free ebook. Go ahead and download it, get started, and there's some recommendations in the back of the book after you finish that will help you get started in your quest for Orthodox magisterial Catholic philosophy. Also, a shout out to everyone who left a review of this podcast over at iTunes. 13 of you left five-star reviews recently, and I want to give a shout out to Shay, JJ, Matibus, Cornelius, Kyle Lamore, EID, PV Riley, Andrea, Ray, Doc LP, and Thelma. And we had two reviews a week. Usually I pick one review of the week. This week I picked two because I liked two of them in particular. The first one was from Mary. And Mary wrote, I first saw a Facebook ad. Oh, here's Facebook. Okay. <laughs> but so I first saw a Facebook ad for a free webcast from Taylor on the Blessed Mother. So this must have been a little bit while back. I learned so much in that short class that I signed up for the podcast. I am now listening to Taylor pretty much daily since I have a lot of catching up to do. I share with all my friends. I really enjoy every show. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Mary, for the kind words and thanks for attending one of our uh, webinars. We do um, live webinars every once in a while, and um, you can go to taylormarshall.com and sign up for those. That's where usually there's about a thousand people, usually mostly Catholics, and we're live. And I'm teaching a subject, a class um, live on the uh, webinar. It's pretty neat. Um, we've been doing several of them over the past year and a half, and uh, they're successful, and a lot of people enjoy them. So if you'd like to do that, Again, sign up at taylormarshall.com. Also, the other um, review of the week comes from a guy named Dastar. And I, I guess it's a guy. It sounds like a guy's name, Dastar. And Dastar writes, I've been listening to Taylor, the Taylor Marshall Show for some time now. Dr. Marshall is very insightful and takes complex theology and makes it accessible and easy to understand. This podcast will be great for anybody wanting to learn more about Christianity on a deeper level. Yes, Dr. Taylor Marshall is Catholic, but I think anyone wanting to learn more will enjoy his podcast. He is a great teacher. This is not televangelism, but it is very enjoyable and informative. If you enjoy this, you can check out more videos and resources by Dr. Taylor Marshall at the New St. Thomas Institute. So, Dastar, thank you. I, I assume that means you're part of the New St. Thomas Institute. So thanks for being a member and a student there, and thanks for the kind words. As always, my goal in this podcast for all the listeners, that's for you, is to take complex things in theology and to make them more easy to understand. That is my prime. of course, my primary goal is to bring glory to God, but my primary goal in teaching is to take complexities and make them easy to understand, and then from there, to make it where you can apply it to your life. So my goal today is you learn about perpetual infelicity. There's some complicated theology. We talked about Montanism and heresy and Tertullian and all that. But ultimately, I hope that you can apply what you learned in that story, which is a historical true story, and you can learn that Jesus is your shepherd. He is calling you to a garden. He wants to be your friend. And no matter what you're going through, you could be in prison with a newborn infant awaiting your martyrdom, or you could be completely stressed out as a mother living in a first world country, or you could be a Christian in the Middle East suffering persecution for your faith. Whatever it is, this example of perpetual infelicity is for our time. I do believe the Holy Spirit still speaks to us, and I do believe that Jesus Christ gives us the grace and the strength to persevere in whatever life may throw at us. So thanks for listening to today's... Po oh, I forgot. Sometimes I just get ahead of myself. Um, I forgot the Latin word of the week. This week is felicitas. Of course, this is the Latin name where we get felicity. It's a feminine word. It is a word meaning happiness. Kind of happiness in like some type in a luckiness. I know we Christians don't believe in luck, but it's a 
happiness of good fortune is probably the best way to define it. And we look at someone like St. Felicity, and from the point of view of the world, here's a woman who was married, who seemed to have a failed marriage. She was pregnant, alone, in prison. She gave birth to a baby in prison. And the prisons back then weren't like the prisons now. All right, it's a rough place. She gives birth in prison, and then she goes and gets torn apart by wild animals. And yet, from the Catholic point of view, from the Christian point of view, from a supernatural viewpoint, she is fortunate. She is blessed. She is happy because she reigns now forever in that garden. She's ascended the ladder that Perpetua saw in the vision, and now she's in the garden with the Lord, with the shepherd. She's in the beatific vision, perfectly happy. So there it is, Perpetua and Felicity, the Latin word Felicitas. May you find Felicitas in your own life. Until next time, remember that our Lord Jesus Christ said that you are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. So go out there and be salty. Hey, thanks for listening to this episode. And if you'd like to hear your name on the shout out in next week's podcast, please go to taylormarshall.com forward slash shout out one word taylormarshall.com forward slash shout out. You can leave a review there. I'd appreciate it. And I'll see you next week's podcast.